Good afternoon. Started a new sermon series in the book of Colossians. And uh, Colossians is, is, is a letter written by Paul to a, a, a little church in what was then known as the province of Asia. Uh, we always think about Asia as this. We, we think about Asia as, uh, you know, Vietnam or, or Japan or something like that. But uh, the province of Asia was actually the Roman province of Asia. And basically it was Turkey, uh, what we know as Turkey today. And, you know, it's, it's always important when you read somebody else's mail to kind of know what's going on, isn't it? You ever read somebody else's letter? Maybe it was you uh, had a book full of them. I, I know there's a book on the Civil War that has letters to home. And it was men who were in the Civil War who were writing. And, and you read those and it just kind of brings you into that spot and into that place that they were at. Or maybe it was uh, the, the President Adams and the letters between him and his wife as they wrote them back and forth. And uh, that's, that's, those are amazing letters to be able to read. Well, here we have the Apostle Paul, and, and we have him writing a letter to this church in Colossae. And, you know, it's, it's important that we kind of understand and know what's going on. And, and we know a little bit about Paul, right? Um, it, it, he started off fairly well off. Born in Tarsus, which was no small city in Rome. You know, in the Roman Empire, it was an important city, and he was very well connected. Uh, he was a Roman citizen. Now, whether he was a Roman citizen by birth or whether he was a Roman citizen by uh, being able to purchase that later, because there were certain ways you could become a, a Roman citizen if you were a wealthy businessman or something like that, and whether his family was uh, that, we don't really know. But he had the best education. He was a rising star in Judaism. He was so zealous for God that when he heard about this, this upstart thing called Christianity and how it was corrupting Judaism, he went on the war path and he began to persecute those people who were Christians, which he believed was a, a, an offshoot of Judaism that was evil and was corrupting Judaism. And so he was going to be zealous for God. And he was going to go out and attack those, those other Christians. He had them arrested and persecuted. He held the coats while Stephen was stoned to death. Until that moment on the road to Damascus where Jesus Christ got a hold of him. Amen? Where suddenly he was completely blinded by the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said to Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? After that, Paul, he, he got on the right path. And it was all about then for him spreading the gospel, especially spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Now, Colossae was a, a small, sleepy little town in a, in a nice little valley. In fact, the only thing that's really of note was that there was something written about the great wool that it produced. So, so we are not talking about a, a place where, you know, there's just all this stuff happening. We're not talking about Corinth where, wow, it's this trade center and all these people are going back and forth. We're talking about Colossae, which was a sleepy little farm village. It was a quiet spot. In fact, the church was established there when Paul was doing his work in Ephesus on one of his missionary trips, and, and somehow he maybe went out or sent somebody out, maybe it had it, been uh, 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 Epaphras, who, who he sent out and established this little church in Colossae. And by all indications, there was no synagogue there. There was, it was not a, a Jewish synagogue that was converted into Christianity or anything like that. It rather seems like the church in Colossae was just a bunch of happy pagans. Uh, as far as we know. Uh, and in fact, when you read what Paul wrote to them, you kind of get that indication that that's indeed the, the fact, that they were, they were pretty much just kind of happy pagans going on with their life and were godless and didn't know anything about God. And somehow the, the evangelists went in there and introduced them to Jesus Christ, and it changed their life. But Paul began getting some reports about what was going on in some of the churches in Asia, and especially this church in Colossae. And, you know, that's, he got these reports that maybe some of the surrounding philosophy of the world they were living in was beginning to, to corrupt and, and show up in an unhealthy way. 
And he doesn't specifically mention it. You know, like the Galatians, when, when the, the Galatians had a problem, Paul wrote to them and, and talked about the Judaizers who were saying, listen, in order to be a good Christian, you've also got to be a good Jew. And, and Paul got after them big time, right? And, and you can read the book of Galatians and wow, very specific thing. But the letter to Colossae, we don't really know exactly what was going on. We just know some things that Paul began to teach them about and say, hey, I want you to remember this. It's kind of like this. A guy was telling me about a a sign that was above a fire extinguisher in a dorm at camp. Now, if you've ever been to camp and they had these fire extinguishers that were the pump-up water ones, we're not talking about the CO2 ones that freeze you to death. We're talking about the ones that are the pump-up water ones. Right, And so if you actually spray those, you can put water back in them and pump them back up again. And the sign above the fire extinguisher said this, right? Fire extinguishers are for fires. Right? We know from that sign that evidently somebody had used the fire extinguisher for something other than fires, right? Well, that was the, the case here. Is it, Paul didn't say this is exactly what's going on, but, but he began to tell us some things and teach some things. And as a result of that, we can kind of get a sense for what it was that Paul was, this other philosophy that was sneaking in. And Paul really wanted to write to them and get them on track. In Colossians 2.8, it says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. See, that's kind of the the reason why he was writing to Colossae was because that's what was going on. This human philosophy that was depending on all these other things was kind of sneaking in and it was corrupting the church. And the church in Colossae was new, which meant that it was vulnerable. Vulnerable to all sorts of philosophical innovations and syncretism and religious imaginations of the day, of which, by the way, Asia was kind of a hotbed for. So we discern some of the things that we're struggling with by what Paul wrote about. But here's where the rubber meets the road, and and why when we read Paul's letter to Colossae, it has so much application to us. See, our society and and the church and our culture faces exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. You ever hear something like this? Well, maybe in my next life I'll be a better Christian. Just think about that for a minute. Right? Maybe in my next life I'll be a better Christian. Okay, wait a minute. They just combined reincarnation with Christianity. That is not going to work. Right? You hear people say that. Or you hear something like this. Um, you say, well, wow, that person really hurt you. Well, karma's going to get them. I'll pray for you so that you, get re- you recover. What? Wait a minute. Karma and praying. You know, if you believe in karma, prayer doesn't work. Because there is no personal God in Buddhism. So who are you praying to? When you're new, there's all kinds of things that seem attractive that, that to, to mix in that make you maybe think that if you mix this into Christianity, it'll make a little bit more sense. And Paul was going to correct some of those things by giving them some solid teaching. And that's what the book of Colossians is about. And today we're really just going to be looking at three verses. But I, I, I want to start with the verses that just kind of get us into the letter. So in Colossians 1... Starting in verse 1, it says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He's letting them know, here's who's writing the letter. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always, thanks God, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras. I've always said that Epaphras, but it's Epaphras. The the P is where the, the slash is. I looked it up this week. Our dear fellow servant, who is an 
faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, Paul starts out telling them that this is what I pray for you. This is what I pray for you people in Colossae. This is the hope I have for you. This is the hope I have for you. You see, Paul was not just praying some pie-in-the-sky hope, right? He, He was not praying that they would obtain some eventual spiritual status like resurrection. Right? When somebody says to you, well, I, I hope you achieve the resurrection, that's great, but it really isn't going to have that big of an impact on you today, right? When you think about that. I can't wait for the resurrection. Oh, it's going to be awesome. But between here and there is a little bit of road. Amen? And so Paul was not praying for them. That he was not praying for some eventual spiritual hope, which he does in other places, but he wasn't doing that. He was praying for them that they would achieve some things right here and now. Right in the present. These are things that he, what he hoped they would achieve right now in this life, in their circumstances. Now, I hope you win a million dollars. Right? That, that's a great sentiment, isn't it? I hope, I hope you win a million dollars. I, I will most likely never win the lottery because I never buy lottery tickets. I, I did one time because I thought it was stupid and I thought it would be funny. So, so we, it was like a billion dollars or something like that. So we all bought it and we watched and the numbers didn't even come up on the TV. We had to look them up on the internet. And it was such a letdown. It was a waste of $3. I could have got a Netflix. <laughs> More entertaining. But I hope you get a, a million dollars. That's, you know, that's the thing that is at least more practical for them. But Paul was actually praying something that was imminently practical to their life right then and there. Right then and there. And the good news that is, is that in that prayer, he identifies the hope that they in Colossae can have. The hope that they can have. And, and for, me, for them, it might have been a new hope. And maybe even for you today, it might be a new hope. You see, he's cutting through the nonsense and praying not only for what is possible, but what that new hope is truly based on. So let's look at the first thing he prays. In Colossians 1.9, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And then he tells them what he's praying. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. That's what he's praying. That they would have that. In the early 17th century, about 1630, there was a brand new invention that was created and we have record of the first thing that that happened. There was this writing on paper thing that began. And... And they they began to write on these papers, and they were able to distribute them to the masses. It was called a newspaper, for those of you that don't know about those. And while they they still exist in old people's homes, what they did was they were these things that would go out daily to people. And in one particular newspaper in the United States, i got to help the millennials who have never heard of newspapers or seen them, right? And so, in one particular newspaper, there was an article, a, a column, which actually they made the newspapers in columns. We don't know why. I don't know why. Didn't they make it in rows? But they made them in columns, and so there was a newspaper column called Dear Abby. Right? Dear Abby. And this is where anonymous people would write to a person they didn't even know and ask their advice on everything. Right? And so she would answer them in this column. Not a row, but a column. 
And she would answer them. Now, I don't know if Dear Abby actually started in the 17th century, if there was a Dear Abby column in the 1630 newspaper, which was the first newspaper ever invented. But people have been asking questions, what should I do? I don't know what to do. Now they call in on the phone or they text Dear Abby, right? They, they, they want to know, what should I do? People encounter all kinds of things in their lives that cause them to ask the question, what should I do? They answer. They want answers in relationships. They want answers in business decisions. Where should I live? All sorts of questions. They want to know what to do. And here's the outstanding thing. What Paul was praying for the church in Colossae was not some wishful thinking, but was really one of the aspects of what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The hope I have and the new hope the Colossian church had was simply this, that God would fill them and fill us with the knowledge of His will through the wisdom and understanding that comes from the Spirit. That's what he was praying for them. They would know what to do. They would be filled with the wisdom and the knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit. He wasn't wishing for that, that someday they would achieve it. He was praying that they would get that right now and right here. And the Spirit does that in so many great ways. Jesus said this, he said, uh, of of the Spirit in John 16, 13, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into the truth. He will not speak on His own, but He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit will be your guide. He will guide you into truth. And in 2 Peter 1, he says this, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. The prophetic message, he's talking about Scripture, is completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining into a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives the knowledge. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks this message that is completely secure. Paul's prayer and hope for them and for us, was not some hope at the end of the age, or, but it's a new hope that we can have right now. We can know and understand God's will because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, all these people are writing Dear Abby because they don't have a clue. We have Jesus Christ in our life. We can know what God's will is. And that work uh, comes as the Spirit interacts with us personally. Yes, the Spirit interacts with us personally. And I believe the Spirit is still speaking to His people today. Amen? The Spirit is still speaking to His people today. And and He's still guiding us in, in a personal way. Now, John says that we're to discern the spirits. To discern the spirits. And, and that's the key. We live in a day and age where, where everything is, is all about feelings. Well, this just felt right, so I did that. And this didn't feel right, so I I didn't do that. It just felt right, so I just kept going to Carl's Jr. (laughs) Right? See, John says you need to discern the spirits, and not every spirit is coming from God. And not every word is coming from God, and not every feeling I have is coming from God. We, we have to discern. Sometimes people have a funny notion that since they have the Holy Spirit, that if something feels right, then it must be from the Spirit of God. But that's not true. We really need to work hard at discerning and listening and understanding what the Spirit is saying because sometimes a feeling is a cleverly disguised desire and has nothing to do with God. Our hearts like to tell us that what we're feeling is the right thing to do, whether it is or not, right? Right? Our hearts are deceptive. They want to tell us, oh, this is the right thing to do, even though it's not. We don't like to get after ourselves. Self-discipline, oh, no. 
Don't preach on self-discipline. That's like praying for patience by accident. You, you just don't want to do that. Right? We, we don't like self-discipline. So we just like to do whatever feels good and whatever we feel. And, and John says, listen, discern the spirits. And, and that's why the Holy Spirit works through Scripture. That's why Scripture is an essential part of the Holy Spirit's work in helping us understand what God's will is. In fact, it's the written will of God. It's God speaking His will. Peter says it's God-breathed. That is, it is Holy Spirit-inspired, enlivened. The Holy Spirit will never prompt you to sin. Amen? Amen? A house divided will not fall. The Holy Spirit will never prompt you to sin. He will never prompt you to go in a direction that will result in sin. So people that are running around saying, well, this, this just felt right, or if you listen to the radio, it feels so good it can't be wrong. <laughs> oh, yes, it can. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> We have to discern what the Spirit is telling us, and the Scripture is the way that we do that. So when we feel something, we need to confirm with Scripture that, yes, indeed, this is from God. And you know what? God has spoken just about, about everything, hasn't He? When you get into the Word of God, either through principle or experience, you can discover that God, His will has been fully revealed to humanity, and there's really no gray areas and the only kind of gray area there is is maybe if God doesn't really care. And what I mean by that is this. You know, if you pray and say, God, do you really want me to be a plumber or an electrician? Well, God may say, listen, you can be a great plumber for me. You can be a great electrician for me. You just do whatever is that the satisfies your heart and do it all as unto me, and that'll be great. So you can choose either one. That's the beautiful thing about God. He gives us great freedom and a lot of different things. We don't have some little path that if we get off, oh no, you know, I'm out of the will of God. It's a lot bigger path than that. In fact, that's why it doesn't say in 2 Hezekiah 4, 7, Chris, thou shalt be a pastor. <laughs> right? God's will is a lot bigger than that. Otherwise, you'd find your name in there and exactly what you're supposed to do. So we've got to confirm that the Holy Spirit is still speaking into our lives. And, and that is confirmed, what he's speaking is confirmed by Scripture. And we need to get rid of the garbage of the world's philosophy. Things that like wealth and health, right? Oh, you can discern God's will for your life or whether you're in God's will or out of God's will because you're getting wealthy or you're healthy. That's heresy, right? That's heresy. Or, or, or feelings trump all else, or, or karma, or all kinds of popular opinions, or scientific opinions, right? People are letting scientific opinions float in and influence what the Word of God says is sin or is not sin. You want to see, well, that's one of the things that Paul was talking about is these earthly philosophies that were getting into the church and affecting, wow, talk about what's going on in our world. That's infecting the church as people aren't discerning the Spirit. We need to get back to the real source of truth, the Spirit at work in us, informed and confirmed through Scripture. And that's what Paul is telling them. Listen, you can have that hope. I'm praying that you have that. You know what God's will is. You can have that. What a great hope. What a great reality that Paul's telling us about. We can be filled with the spiritual knowledge of God's will. <laughs> I mean, that, we don't promote that enough. We don't talk about that. We don't celebrate that enough. You can know what God's will is. That's what Paul's saying. You can absolutely know what God's will is. That's an incredible promise. So why does he pray this? Well, that kind of brings us to the second reality. In, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 1, 10 and 11, he says, I pray this, why? So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Here's a question to ask yourself. Is it possible to live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way? Is that possible? 
Is it possible to live a life worthy of the Lord and to please Him in every way? Sometimes I think Christians have fallen into a trap. The trap kind of goes like this. They know that they sin, right? We, we're all our worst judges because we know everything we've done. Um, and, and in fact, we know what we think, which Jesus says, listen, it's not about adultery. It's about lust. It's not about what you, th- you did. It's actually what you thought. And so we all know what our thoughts are. and We're thinking, wow, <laughs> I could never live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way because I know who I am. <laughs> And that's what we begin to think. They know that they still mess up sometimes. Sometimes it's on accident, but other times it's willful. And we know that the right we, we know the right thing, but because we're either being selfish or stupid, we do the wrong thing. Right? So we rely on grace, but in our hearts we think I can never really live a life that pleases the Lord. So I just muddle through. It's kind of like at the end of the Monopoly game. Right? You know who's going to win. Right? I mean, it's just not a question. They've got all the little red hotels on their thing. And every time you go around, you're just paying out money. And you know it's not you. You've got like Oriental Place over there and it's a shabby hotel. You know you're not going to win. But you just keep rolling the dice and thinking, well, I'm never going to win, but I might as well just play it out. And that's sometimes how how Christians think. They think this, well, I can never really live a life that's going to be worthy of the Lord or please Him in every way, so, you know, I'm just going to keep rolling and let's just play this thing out. Because that's all I got. And that's what they think. But here's what I want to tell you. What Paul was praying for the church in Colossae is what I want to tell you today. You can live a life worthy of the Lord, and please Him in every way. Amen? You really can. That's the hope we have. It wasn't just this pie in the sky prayer that Paul was having for the church in Colossae when they were resurrected. This was a thing that he wanted them to have right now. Because he didn't want them just rolling the dice and playing through at the end of the Monopoly game. He wanted them to know that they could still win. They can still live a life that's like that. And that's pretty amazing. That's possible. That's worth striving for. To live a life worthy of the Lord. And please Him in every way. And then he defines what that means. (laughs) Because you know what he doesn't say? He says, and being absolutely perfect and never making another mistake. He doesn't say that. He defines what it means to live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Now, it's not an exhaustive list, but this is what he says. One, bearing fruit in every good work. God wants us to bear fruit in the good works that we do. Amen? He wants us to bear fruit. It's the parable of the shrewd manager who leaves the talents to the guy who says, listen, I'm going away. When I come back, you better all make some money. And, and, And that's what he does. He wants us to bear fruit. In the parable of the sower, sometimes it grows 10, sometimes it grows 6, sometimes it grows 30, sometimes it grows 100. But every time it needs to bear fruit. Growing in the knowledge of God, says Paul. Why do Christians who are already Christian, who already know the Bible, continue to study the Bible? Why do we want to know more about God? Why? Well, because when we know more about God, we can please Him even more and more and more. You see, Paul's will for them, Paul's saying this is what God wants for you. If you want to live a life that pleases God in every way, here's how you do it. Grow in the knowledge of God. Because the more you know, the better you'll do. Now, a lot of us are educated way beyond our obedience. Amen? We know a lot more stuff we ought to do than the stuff we do. So we need to work on that first one before we work on that second one. But then he says this third one, getting stronger in the Lord and in the power of the Lord so that you will have great endurance and patience. Wow. See, a life that is worthy of the Lord is one that is filled with great strength, endurance, and patience. We're not the sort that just gives up. We're not the sort that just turns around and says, oh man, this is too hard, I quit. That's not going to please the Lord. 
fact, he says, whoever takes, puts their hand to the plow and then takes their hand away was never worthy to begin with. He wants us to have strength and endurance to be able to face anything. And so how do we do that? Well, we do that by getting to know God and, and the power that we have in Him. We do that by bearing fruit, and that fruit follows us around. You see, it's not an exhaustive list that Paul gives, but guess what? It, you get the right idea. A life that pleases Christ is one that is bearing fruit in all the areas of life where he's called you. Bear fruit in your relationships, if it's a friendship or as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a child, as a teenager in your home. Bear fruit in your relationships. Be, be excellent in that. Bear fruit in your ministry efforts, helping people who need it. Ministries, services of every kind. Bear fruit in that. Grow in your knowledge of God. Be a lifelong learner when it comes to God. You're never going to learn it all. The scripture is so deep that the most experienced cliff diver can dive with all his might and never reach the bottom. And yet it's safe enough for the baby to wade in. Learn it more and more and more. And become stronger so that you have great endurance and patience. You see, the lie is that because we make mistakes in this life that we can never fully please the Lord, and, and that's just a lie. We can fully please the Lord. That's what it means when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, well done, you were perfect. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. I will make you perfect. You can't do that part. I got that. But you did a good job. We can please the Lord. And that should be encouraging. That should give us great hope. Amen? We should be happy. I can please it. You know, I hate those things that I hate. I never play games I can't win. So I don't play very many games. Right? No, I, I just don't play games that I can't win. But why would I want to do that? But with God, we can. He says we can, we can live that kind of life. And the evil one, he, he wants to keep us weak and ineffective. And ultimately, if his goal is that if he can win a small victory, it, you know, he really wants to consume us. That's what his whole deal is. He wants to consume us. But if that takes a thousand bites, okay. Right? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And, and, and if his goal is to completely consume us, he goes around running around like a, a roaring lion to completely consume us. And we always think about that, oh, it's one big chomp. Nah, sometimes it's a nibble. And, and if he can keep us weak, you see, he's already lost, so he has nothing to lose. We need to defeat that lie, that philosophy that's gotten in that we can't truly please the Lord or live a life worthy of him. We can. That's Paul's hope. And there's one last final reality that he reveals in his prayer. He says this in Colossians 1, 12 through 14. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I love this part. The Father has qualified us through Jesus. He's qualified us through Jesus. The world tells us that we're not worthy of anything. That's what the world says. You're not worthy. You're not worthy of those accolades. You're not worthy of, uh, of getting into the kingdom of God. You're not worthy of that. The world likes to point out, well, you fail over and over and over again. You're not worthy. The evil one does everything he can to destroy us. But Paul says, listen, the Father has already qualified you. He's already qualified you. Don't you love it when you go car shopping and you've been pre-qualified? Right? You can go in there and you can go with confidence and you can dicker on the price and all this. Why? Because I'm pre-qualified. Well, don't you need financing? No, I'm pre-qualified. You know, that's the confidence that we can have in Jesus Christ. We are pre-qualified to enter into the kingdom of God, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus Christ has already done. The Father pre-qualified us. We have the ultimate pre-qualification letter. And we can have hope in that. Amen?
We can have hope in that. It's a done deal. You ever watch those shows where they build the house in seven days? Makes you wonder about the quality, doesn't it? But beyond that, I love it at the end where they show you the house, you know, move that bus or whatever they used to do. And then every once in a while they would say, and listen, your mortgage has been completely paid off. Man, wouldn't you like to get that note? Amen? Your mortgage is paid off. You didn't do it. God did. He completely paid it off. He did it, and that's the new hope that we have. We don't have to have a special knowledge. We don't have to have a special ritual that we do. We don't have to have just the right philosophy or be the perfect person because he's already done it. The church in Colossae was mixed up. They thought there were all these intermediaries in between them and Christ and between Christ and God. And they thought that they had to do all of these things. And, and, and they had mixed the philosophy of a, a number of things in with their, with their Christianity. And Paul said, no, listen, forget all of that. You don't have to have the special knowledge. You don't have to have any of that. You're already pre-qualified to be in kingdom. And God did that, not you. God did that, not you. That's the hope we have. That's the blessed hope. We're already in. The world tells you you have to earn it. On the other hand, they tell you you never can. We just got to reject those things and grab onto what God is already telling us. And when we already have it, that lets us say, listen, my life is already his. I, he's already pre-qualified me so I can live my life out of gratitude to what he's already done for me. That's an amazing hope. So Paul is praying this for the Colossians, but it's not some pie in the sky kind of thing. What he is doing is he's saying, this is what you can have right now. And so can we as the worship team comes up. I just want to remind you what he's praying. He says that he wants to pray for them that they would know exactly what God's will was. And that they could know it. And that they could live a life worthy of Christ. And they were already qualified. And that's, that's my prayer for you today too. And my prayer for us. That we would, by the power of his spirit, and his work as counselor and guide, as the one who both inspires and uses the scripture, that we would know fully what God's will is. God's will. And we would live a life that is worthy of Christ. That's worthy of Christ. Not out of our own strength. We, we have to rest and trust in his strength. But in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, constantly bearing fruit, constantly learning, getting stronger, able to handle whatever this life is going to throw at us, that we can do that. We can live that kind of life. That's the hope we have. My prayer is that we realize that God has already qualified us. He's already rescued us. You see, grab on to and live into that hope. And when you do that, when you live into the hope that Paul was praying for the Colossian church, you'll walk with confidence. You'll walk with strength. You'll reject the philosophies of this world that try and get in and mix in with the truth of it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that we can listen and learn from the Word, from the things that you had Paul write to that church, which really is just us. Lord, help us today that we grab onto that hope. That we grab onto the reality of the Holy Spirit working as guide in our life that we can know your will. Help us grab onto the reality, Lord, that we can live a life that's worthy of you and not being afraid of our failures because that's not what it's about. It's about bearing fruit. It's about giving everything to our ministries. Whatever you've called us to, we give it our whole heart. You cover us with your grace for the mistakes that you know we're going to make. Still, we give it all to please you. And God, help us live into the hope we have knowing that you've pre-qualified us. Thank you for what you did. You did it when I was still a sinner. 
in hope and knowledge that I would come to you. And I pray, Lord, we live with that kind of hope. We live with that kind of confidence. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name.